So tonight I'm talking about um, whose fault, let's start with whose fault this was. Um, quite a bold statement and it's something that I felt, um, you know, somebody somewhere must have been to blame for what happened uh, to me and to Billy. Um, whose fault and what happened and why did it happen? They're the kind of the questions that you want you want answering. I would say that when um, they initially couldn't find Billy's heartbeat and they had diagnosed preeclampsia, I felt like I was being made out to have uh, missed vital signs of having preeclampsia, ignored these signs and it was the preeclampsia that had caused the um, placenta to fail um, and I felt this kind of being pushed onto me even before I'd being being diagnosed with help syndrome so this is you know we found out he's not he's not made it he's got no heartbeat um we're taken into the side room and then we're taken over to, to the labor ward and at that point maybe a few hours has passed and, and uh, my mum had arrived i think my sisters had arrived uh, and, and one of probably my mum asked why um why what their thoughts are in t were in terms of what had gone wrong and their initial uh, assumption was uh, and it was very strong it wasn't like oh we're not sure it was a very preeclampsia um and that then led me on a significant road of guilt um which I still live with today um and uh a lot of a lot of bereaved parent parents live with it um because I was made to feel like I'd missed signs that I had preeclampsia when all I had was protein in my urine which they told me was a kidney infection and a mild headache which we all know we get when we're pregnant in every pregnancy and a bit of swelling well we all get a swelling so i didn't have any dizziness i didn't have any flashing lights i didn't have any blurred vision i didn't have any i didn't feel unwell i didn't have any of the symptoms of having preeclampsia aside from protein in my urine and um because of that they didn't investigate further as to whether the protein could have been more than just a um, kidney infection so um, potentially there was there may have been, been an opportunity to diagnose preeclampsia earlier if they had not assumed that the protein was purely down to my kidney infection um, which I um remember a particular midwife appointment that I was at um and you know what midwives are great but like with any profession you get good and bad ones um this one was a I would never see her again um I saw her again when I was pregnant with Florence and I ended up having to complain to the um to the hospital about her um, her, her lack of due care was was beyond anything that I could comprehend. Um, so I was made to feel like I'd missed signs that I should that that I should have raised an alarm. I'm like, well, you're the guys looking after me. I mean, I've never, I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm looking for. Uh, and therefore that that was it that was it that was my fault it's preeclampsia um we didn't know uh, blah 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 kind of didn't sit right with me um from the start i thought well how, i don't like people making assumptions in life generally um i think i've said before i 
run my life on um, logic and data and um, black and white and all the rest of it. So to assume and have that assumption pushed on you without any, because they'd done at this point they'd done no medical examination of me aside from the fact that Billy had passed away and I had high blood pressure. To make that huge assumption that it was preeclampsia uh, and that was the end of it um, didn't sit right with me. Um, so I'd already got into kind of guilt mode even before uh, labour had set in. I was like, it's my fault. My fault. I've missed something. Don't know what I was looking for, but clearly, based on what they're telling me, I've missed something that, um, that I should have noticed. I should have called someone. Um, I should have spoke to someone. I should have you know done more therefore it's my fault all my fault and to a degree that I still feel that today um then obviously I yeah, then developed help syndrome uh we delivered Billy I was extremely poorly my consultant who who was amazing who I'd be who I'd been seen since I was 17 um, I think I said that all the consultants were in on a Saturday, so I knew it was a pretty serious situation at that point. Um, he said, he, I said, I, I said, I remember the conversation, and I don't remember an awful lot, but I, I remember turning to him and I said, they're trying to tell me that it was preeclampsia that caused this to happen. Um, and I need to make a decision about whether I move forward with a post-mortem. And he looked at me and he said, no way was this preeclampsia. No way. You need to get a post-mortem. And he was adamant, um, which gave me a little reassurance. Um, but still, uh, uh, you know, I was still c extremely concerned that I should have and could have done more uh, and indeed that lives with me now um, I rarely trust anyone certainly I don't trust medically don't trust anyone I, uh, I go off and figure it out myself and tell people what they should be doing and what scans I need and what treatment regime I want um, and that's not right you know, you shouldn't have to fight for the care to get a baby safely into the world. Um, I'll talk about that in a, in a little minute when I when I talk about my pregnancy with Florence. Um, so we did the post mortem, um, and we had to wait three months for the, for the results. I think I'd said that in the first post. Um, which were pretty brutal. I mean, between October and the end of this, and the end of January, um, we obviously got Christmas and New Year. Um, originally, um, me and Nick were going to try and disappear for Christmas, get on a plane, go, see you later. Um, but he unfortunately was undergoing some. Um, uh, kind of straightforward tests for a hernia and we couldn't get medical insurance uh, which meant we had to delay our trip until all the um, results were in which meant we didn't go away till February um, we just did not want to be around Christmas and it, we we kind of cancelled it in our heads um, obviously we joined you know we joined in anything that was going on but um, in terms of like putting a tree up at home and stuff like that we weren't going to do it anyway at the last minute um we decided we'd get a tree and put it up and you know try and i guess do the best with what we've got for other people really we didn't want to do it we had no interest in doing it but I think if we just closed ourselves off and not um, taken part in the you know usual standard affairs that go on around a big family um, every year, that would have just caused more worry than anything else, and I didn't want people to worry. 
So we got through Christmas. Um, January, I also made the decision to go back to work. Um, at the time, I was a HR manager for a um, major food manufacturer called um, Bacavor, as many people know. Um, and integrating back into work was one of the hardest things that I've had to do. I had people um, walk in the opposite direction. Um, I had people like not actively avoiding me, like they would walk to the other side of the car park so that they didn't have to kind of um, walk past me. Um, I had people that would just avoid the subject completely um, and act like nothing had gone on. Um, yeah, work was... And also, I remember, I mean, bearing in mind, I'd only been... I'd only finished work in the October and this was now the January. Um, I don't think my employer did enough to let everybody know what had happened I mean I appreciate I was in a big I was you know leading a big business unit but um I had people come up to multiple people come up to me and say how are you back at work already how's your little boy doing and I was like what like he died how can you not know that so is it if you're an employer having to deal with this situation, I would say, you know, be sensitive, talk to the person that's returning to work and ask them what you want them to do because it's hard enough getting up in the morning, never mind going back to work and facing people who, you know, saw you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and gave you gifts on your last day and then you're back at work like, 10 weeks later or something and they're saying how's your baby it's like it's just quite honestly it's disgusting I was I, I, I was disgusted with how poorly um it had been managed because that's not how I would have managed it if somebody um it, it, you know obviously if, some, if that had happened to somebody else in the organization and I was advising um a manager on how to integrate someone back into the workplace it was just horrendous um at that point I was really low the only point the only thing keeping me going was the appointment it was the end of January 27th or 28th of January I was purely focused on that date I needed to get to that date I needed to get answers so um we we got to that date this date that we'd been working towards since the day after we lost Billy so since the 25th of October um, we've been working towards this state of the end of January and we got there and on the morning of the appointment um, the hospital rang me and they said um, the all the tests have been complete but the um, coroner is it the coroner I think, I think they're called coroners aren't they oh, I don't know um, the person that um, had undertaken all of the tests on Billy, had not had time to um, write the report up. So um, the information was at older hay and that it was unlikely that they were going to be able to get the um, summarised info typed up and over to my hospital for my appointment in the afternoon. At that point, I just went into meltdown because I'd waited three months. Everyone knew that the, you know the situation it's not a normal everyday situation you know you, you, although stillbirth is more common than we would like it's not like this person is doing uh, um, autopsy after autopsy all day long on newborn babies so to ring me on the day you just like people seem to be in the wrong job I mean there was just like a lack of empathy it was like oh yeah we might need to postpone your appointment it was like are you joking me like I've been waiting three months 
my baby died, like I need an answer, so you need to go figure it out. Um, anyway, I spoke to my consultant secretary um, and she she sorted it out. Um, she was brilliant and she you know she she always has been um but to even just have to go through that to have to take that call and all the rest of it it was like just don't need it really don't need it so we got to the hospital um taken to one of those like side rooms where you know you just get a feeling that that's where they give bad news so you know there was little a little couch and two chairs and all the rest of it definitely you know it's not a consulting room there's no you know there's no bed in it or there's no desk in it or there's nothing like that and um we spent quite a while talking to my consultant about the results which is when he said uh because the, the first i went with a notepad full of questions um so anyone going through it or uh, any kind of medical situation I it's hard to think in the moment so always write down your questions as you go and take the take the list with you because you can never think of them all on the spot so I had a list of questions that I wanted him to to, to answer um, and the first one I asked him was it preeclampsia no 100% no definitely not was there anything that I could have done? No, definitely not. Um, was there a link between what happened and the help syndrome, help syndrome that I developed? Possibly, but um, there wasn't enough research to confirm that. It's not. It's not the norm for somebody who's had a stillbirth or preeclampsia to develop help syndrome so uh, right okay so it wasn't preeclampsia well I didn't miss something that I should have done what was it then so that this was when he, he said it was something called fetal thrombotic thrombotic uh, vasculopathy um, so at this point was the point that I learned a lot about placentas they're so gross, but they're so amazing at the same time. Uh, they have so many, like, so many tiny, tiny, tiny little blood vessels in this one, um, almost just like a, like a tube, I guess. And it provides nutrients from the baby to, from the mother to the baby. Nutrients, um, oxygen and pee and all the rest of it. Um, and in these tiny vessels, um, very small blood clots had started to form. And eventually, obviously, the small blood clots build up and g gradually would have cut off the nutrients to um, Billy. But it was in a certain section of the placenta, so it wasn't like the whole placenta, so it wouldn't he said it wouldn't have been a slow process he wouldn't have been in pain he you know he he, he wouldn't have struggled um which you know gives you a little bit of uh comfort i guess um that he he you know he wasn't in any pain he went peacefully um okay so it was ftv so what does that mean for the future because at one point they thought i had a chronic um clotting disorder um i can't remember the medical term for it but they call it sticky blood um and they thought that that was the cause of um the um nutrients being cut off because you, you, your blood's essentially sticky sticks sticks together sticks to the vessels the vessels can't open um i didn't have sticky blood although i um did show uh, um quite significant signs of having that um it, it, it definitely wasn't it, all the tests they were all negative um retests have been done there, there was just 
the only thing that they could find was this FTV, this uh, thrombotic um, situation, and it likely um, was there all along, but often. Um, I think quite a few women in my tribe had um, lost their babies through blood clots of the placenta or, or certainly issues with the placenta. Uh, and quite often it's a big clot or a couple of big clots, like visible. Um, but obviously when they looked at my placenta once Billy had been born, they couldn't see any, any clots. It was when it went off, off for autopsy that they saw... Uh, well, they, they they obviously cut it up and examined it and found these very, very small clots. So um, the question then was, what happens next? Um, because you have spent nine months being pregnant, you've held your baby and you've gone home without one. And it is something that I cannot describe. And there's a book called... Um, empty. I think it's empty arms and a broken heart. Um, it was one that I. I mean, I've read tons of them, but the empty arms bit is a physical pain that you feel when you've lost your baby, and up until this day, the only way that I could ease that, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't. I, I couldn't sleep. There was. It was a physical thing that I could not, I couldn't understand. And the only way that I could sleep was by hugging a pillow. Um, and it sounds, sounds quite stupid. Um, but today, if, I, if I'm not hugging a pillow, I cannot get to sleep. Um, and there's definitely... Um, physical things that affect you you know empty arms broken heart is probably sums it up perfectly um it was a book that was written quite a long time ago um but you know all the points in it are still very pertinent today um so yeah still to this day i need to go to sleep with a hug in a pillow can't sleep otherwise so, um, the what happens next, que next question is, is a very <clears throat> personal, individual decision. For me and Nick, um, we wanted answers and we wanted to have another baby. Um, I asked people to not use the term try again. So, are you going to try again? Uh, I know that's probably quite a common phrase to ask people. Um, to me personally, try again indicates that I failed at something and I didn't fail. So, um, I would always caution people to really think about the words that they're using. And if you are unsure about whether, um, the words are going to trigger or upset someone, Quite honestly, just sitting next to them, just sitting next to me is fine. Don't say anything, just sit next to me. I'm fine sitting in silence. I've got friends that will just sit next to me and, you know, we'll just people watch. It's perfectly fine. I would rather that than um, people say some really like stupid things as well, like stupid, stupid things. Um, but I'll get I'll get into that on another another post. But um, so we made the decision to have another child, not try again. Um, and obviously, Billy had been a clomid baby. Um, Mister Lucas at our hospital said I could start on clomid straight away. I was hoping and praying that it wouldn't be another four or five or six months round of fertility treatment because it's just a killer um, on your body. It, it really is just grueling. Um, and we were so, so blessed to become pregnant with Florence on the first cycle of Clomid after we'd had our results. 
Um, and I do believe that, and I always say it, Florence was sent to save me from self-destruction because had I not got pregnant again, I cannot even say where I would be now. I mean, you know, my thoughts today are very different than they were back then. But, you know, I know some women that have not been able to get pregnant again and they've not been able to have a child after their loss and I really don't know how they um, how they get through it. Um, we felt so lucky to get pregnant first time round, but again, so, so anxious. We'd had a miscarriage and now we'd had a full term stillbirth. We'd had both ends of the spectrum. It was like, how the shit am I going to get through this? So, of course, you get through the first 12 weeks, still super sick. Yeah, it was really nice. Super sick. Um, and the way that I got through it, and, I, and I'd said this to a few people, I would, day by day, um, which is not my natural way of dealing with life, I'm a planner, I'm planning right into the future, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, forward thinking into what next, what next, what next. Uh, being pregnant forces me to be in today. So I'd wake up, and I'd puke and I'd go, that's great. That's a sign that something is still going on. My body's telling me that I'm still pregnant. And I'd go to bed at night and I'd say to myself, let's reflect on the day. Is there anything that I feel a little bit off about that I'm not sure about, that I've got instinct about? No, okay, so there's nothing to tell me today that I'm not pregnant, so Therefore, I'm going to sleep and I'm pregnant. And I do that. It was like a ritual every single day. The modified care in the pregnancy with Florence was uh, medication. So medication and increased monitoring. So medication was um, I take aspirin every day and also inject um, two lots of blood thinners with the A twofold really um there were there, there'd been lots of research that this would reduce the risk of a repeat of preeclampsia obviously nobody wanted that considering how poorly i'd been and you're at a slightly increased risk of having it again if you've had it before um and also with the clotting situation um if the blood was slightly thinner than normal um, it was less likely to clot, so it was it was unlikely that the fetal um, thrombotic vasculopathy would happen again if I was um, on blood thinners. So that was that was kind of my medical regime. Um, the care regime was quite different, um, so fairly standard up until about twenty ish weeks. You know, there's not much anybody can do before then. Um, had the anomaly scan, um, had it early again before the hospital offered it to me. We found out we were having a girl. Quite honestly, I was relieved. I don't know how I would have coped um, with with that pregnancy had it been a boy because all of the dates were the same. The EDD was the same, so their due date was the same. Although Florence was never going to be born um, anywhere near a due date she was always going to come early um, scan dates were the same everything was the same months triggers you know everything associated with Florence's pregnancy was the same as with Billy's pregnancy so we were I'm not sure about Nick but I was super relieved to find out we were having um, a girl um I'll talk in another post about how difficult I found it to bond in that pregnancy um, and that, what that caused afterwards for me personally. Um, it kind of links back to what I touched on yesterday in the tribe and the people that you need around you to be on your side and, and be there when you need them. 
So the modified care after 20 weeks was scans every two weeks. What they were looking for were growth restrictions, although Billy didn't have any growth restrictions. Um, that's, a, that's a sign. Um, they were uh, dot an analyzing the placenta dot with a Doppler flow analyzer. So this is um, looking at the blood flow through the placenta. And with Florence, they identified that there was a potential notch in the placenta, which could have caused an issue. So if you think about a placenta, it generally is like that. Um, and the blood, you know, the blood flows freely around it. Obviously, it bends around and all the rest of it. But, you know, the, the way that things, the blood flows through it is in a straight line. Um, a notch can be anything from like that to like that. So this means at the point that um, the, the blood hits the notch, some of it bounces back and not all of it gets through. So um, yeah, that's what that's that's the that's the Rachelism of a notch, placental notch. I'm sure the doctors would kill me for describing it in that way, but hey. So um, this meant we were then under fetal medicine because I was high risk, and then now I was even higher, higher risk. So looking for growth restrictions and all the rest of it, monitored every every two every two weeks at that point. Um, I'd already said that there was no way I was going beyond 37 weeks and there was no way that I was having a natural labour because some of the stories and people that I'd been in contact with had lost their babies during labour. And quite honestly, if I had got to 37 weeks, which is classed as full term, I'm not going into labour, I'm not taking any more risks. So I made the decision um, that I was going to have an elective C-section. Um, it was non-negotiable. I stood my ground. Um, I was tried a little bit to be convinced about maybe pushing it to 38 weeks or, you know, maybe trying natural labour and all the rest of it. And I went, no, sorry, you're wasting your breath. 37 weeks, bang gone, no later. Um, so we'd agreed a, pl a care plan. Um Florence was planned in to be born bang on 37 weeks. Um, because she's slightly um, early, they give steroids to just protect the lungs. Because um, uh, sometimes they come out with um, uh, their lungs quite aren't mature enough. But for me, 37 weeks, she was better out of me than in, in me. You know, the, ne the neonatal team could take better care of me than my body could take care of her based on my experience so um we'd agreed on that and then i got to my what i thought was going to be my last scan appointment before um i had florence and my consultant was karen mcintyre um, and she's based at Leighton hospital in crew and she has delivered all three of my babies and she's amazing like she if I talk about her, I'll cry because, like, she, she's just amazing. Um, she, she gave me the scan on the Tuesday, and I'd seen her from twenty weeks through to when I was now like thirty-seven. Every two weeks, I'd seen her, um, and she said, mm, "I'm not sure." Oh, this last, this was the last appointment. She said, mm, "I'm not sure." She said. Not sure. It doesn't look too too different, but um, I'd like I'd like you to, I'd like to admit you, and we'll just deliver it tomorrow, just in case. And at this point, I was like, Shh, I wasn't ready for that. I'd not finished. I'd like I'd left my house. I'd half cleaned my kitchen cupboards. All my shoe cupboard was in the middle of being sorted. Literally, I'd literally didn't. I had no expectation of walking into that appointment and not and not being allowed to go home again um and Karen in that situation acted completely on her initiative because the medical advice in front of her was saying yeah 
it kind of looks okay. It looks a bit different, but yeah, I'll probably be all right. And she was like, no, no, based on your history, no, something just feels off. I need to admit you, I want to monitor you overnight. Um, and um, I want to trace every hour. And basically, so basically you're not going to get any sleep. And you're first on my list in the morning for an elective section. So that came as a complete shock to me. Um, and great worry because then I had like from fetal medicine clinics in the afternoon so let's say it was three o'clock through to nine o'clock the next day she's told me that she feels something's not quite right but she's not getting my baby out for another you know 16 hours so there's 16 hours for things to go wrong so I basically lay awake um the poor midwives on the labor ward were sick of me not I'm not sick of me if that was just figuratively um um wanting the trace machine in the end they just left me on trace because they knew, they knew they was, I was just going to want it back all the time um blood pressure was being monitored um continuously and she did it the next day she got her out she was born at 36 she was just shy of 37 weeks so she was 36 plus four I think so she was classed as prem um and we had a little bit of trouble with her sugar levels which nothing abnormal really um she didn't need neonatal care she just needed a hot cot and some uh, she was a little bit lazy with the feeding so she was perfectly healthy um amazing like I heard a scream it was me and nick were just i can just remember it now just crying our eyes out because we'd actually made it and we didn't think we were going to get well I didn't think we were going to get there it makes me tear up now um and so elective c-section so they're sewing me back up and Karen McIntyre said I'm so glad I went with my decision she said that placenta was a mess she said it was about to fail I can't say whether it would have got you any, I can't say at what point. I can't say whether it, you know, you would have given birth naturally, she said, but it was fragmented. It was not, it was not in a good place. It was about to fail. I'm so glad we made the decision to deliver your baby and forever indebted to her gut instinct because I will never know whether if she just kind of looked at the medical info and gone, yeah, it'll be all right. It, the outcome might have been different. We never know. And it doesn't, it kind of doesn't matter because Florence is here now. She's just turned nine and she's causing havoc downstairs. I can hear her. She's the right little madam sometimes. Um, she can be a little bit of a um, bossy, bossy one. She, ooh, yeah. Mm, she's got a stubborn streak in her. Let's get it off her dad. Um, so that's a little bit, I've gone on for quite a while tonight, about placentas. I know a lot about them because I read a lot about them um, because I felt I needed to. I did not trust anyone. I probably, tr it's not fair to say, I trusted that Karen McIntyre had my best interests at heart. But I also acknowledged that she had to work under NHS regime you know you can't just go off and do your own thing there's protocol that she has to follow and all the rest of it so I in that pregnancy felt um, that I had to have every single scrap of knowledge and basically I could now be an obstetrician because I know everything about everything so um, if anyone's ever pregnant they're always asking me questions and I can always give them the answers <laughs> Um, and that's how I get 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 through life. Really, I don't. Tr I don't. I just don't trust a lot of people, not just medically, just generally. Um, and I don't think I was that person before Billy. I think I was quite, you know, trusting. Unless someone had given me a reason not to trust them, I would have trusted them. But now my default setting is like no sorry you got to prove yourself before you can get in this club um i'm very aware of it i had a conversation recently with the with one of my colleagues about it um and 
it's always something I uh, I work on. Um, but the most important thing is that I trust the people that are closest to me. And that's all I need. Um, my advice to anybody going through um, pregnancy after loss is to equip yourself with as much knowledge as you can. Ask as many questions as you feel you need answers to. And if you feel that something is not right, you ring up that labour ward and you make them do something about it to allay your fears because your gut instinct is the one thing that they don't have. Your gut instinct, always go with it. Even if it means you feel you're like you're being a pain in the arse, um, you feel like they're probably talking about you when they're having the dinner, like, oh, she's back again for another trace. Whatever, I don't care if you're talking about me because I'm one, all I want is a baby at the end of it. You know, this is my life. You, as a profession, I feel failed me. So I've got to take control of the situation and that's how I dealt with it. So knowledge is power. Get yourself to a point where you feel you're empowered. And there are loads more charities around now. Kicks Count is an amazing charity. Um, who campaign around monitoring babies' movements and, you know, there's um, empowering not just individuals but also training midwives around movements and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, knowledge is power. Become your own advocate because no one else will. And that goes for whatever you're going through. So I'm sorry, this has been like the longest post ever and I don't expect anyone to um, probably listen to it all or get bored or maybe fall asleep. Um, but I'll be back tomorrow and I'm going to talk about rainbow babies. I've got three of them. Florence is nine, Elsie is nearly seven. They'll, but they're both going to be dancing in the show, which I'm really excited about with their dance group Dawn Hall Dancers and I have got a little Tara um, who is nearly two and she is called Nora named after my nan and Nora was a miracle IVF baby so I'll talk about our IVF journey as well so hopefully I'll do that tomorrow although we're flying to Cape Verde on Wednesday so still not packed I've got to pull a 12-hour shift tomorrow to catch up on all my work so might be looking a bit worse for wear so but I will get on here <laughs>